Hello, we are at ECAD 2019 in London. My name is Viola Edward. I'm a psychotherapist and breathwork lead trainer. And I have the enormous pleasure to interview today Dr. Mel Paul. Please, Mel, tell us about you. Uh, family practice doctor, uh, trained in the United States at University of Buffalo. Uh, and I moved to Las Vegas to be a family doctor. And uh, along the way, the doctor who I was working with was the director of an addiction treatment program. I was always interested in addiction, and I found out later, five years later, that I needed to get sober myself and stop <laughs> drinking. So for four, four and a half years, I was the director of a drug treatment program, but I was also using drugs. Without knowing that you were yeah. part so of it. So when you say, why did you end up in addiction, I think that's why, to yeah. get sober. And you know, I've been sober 34 years and been in the field and just fascinated by addiction and the center that I work at in Las Vegas we treat a lot of people with opioid addiction yeah. in the United States that's the number one drug that people get admitted with and people about more than half the people that were there had pain chronic pain yes they were taking the pills for the pain yes yeah. so I would take them off their medication because that's what I did and they would say well what are you going to do about my pain and I'd say oh, I don't know you know go back to the doctor yeah well, the doctor prescribed the pills so again I got very interested in, in pain and what I could do to help people deal with both pain and with their drug addiction. Yeah. And since how many years since then? Uh, 12, 12. 12 years that we've been doing chronic pain, uh, we call it pain recovery uh, yes. uh, instead of pain management because really we, we use medication but not opioids. Uh, and what we found is it's fascinating. You know, we, we take people off these very habit-forming potent medications and instead of getting worse they get better so the opioids are really causing more pain yeah in the patient and yes people have a hard time believing that but yes. it's the truth yes. it's like is the is the remedy become much worse than the yes. illness itself yes, yes. And, and it happens because of tolerance and physical dependence so people take the pills regularly and then between doses they they feel bad but more important, the actual opioid in long-term use causes pain levels to go up. It causes inflammation in the, in the brain cells. Yes. I wondered, for example, I am a person who my threshold to pain is very, very low. Mm -hmm. And in this room, is, uh, with us, is uh, my, my doctor, chiropractor, uh, uh, doctor practitioner who helped me a lot to, to deal with it. And how important it has been for me in my life since I'm sober, is to use the breath work as a first methodology. First thing mm -hmm. I do is to go into how to use breathing with purpose to be able to to be able to be balanced and to be grounded and deal with yes. the pain that I know in myself is is very exaggerated. Like yes. I know I, I have the observer quite developed, the witness. And I can see, but at the same time, I have my body who's telling me I'm scared and it hurts. Yes. So how did I do to escape from medication or coming from a family that go around with a bag of medication? It has been the conscious breathing. Yeah. So I've been reading in your, in your bio that you use mindfulness and you use different tools. Tell us about this. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's a wonder, your description is very wonderful. But if you can be in the observer, if I can step back from the pain, the part of you that's observing is not in pain. So cultivating the practice, and that's a, that's a mindfulness practice using the breath, to actually step away from this story, the, the narrative. The narrative is, my back is killing me, you know, I can't stand this, it's not fair, uh, I want it to go away, it'll never go away, it's going to get worse. All those sort of, they're, they're, it's fabrication of the mind. You know? mm. and, and a lot of it's based on previous experience. So a patient says to me, I'm feeling pretty good now, but it's going to get worse. And I say, well, why? He said, because it always gets worse at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. So we begin to explore what happens at 2 o'clock. But we had a patient who, he had a 10 out of 10 pain. He was angry and frustrated. He had terrible back. He had uh, spinal disease. He had fusions, you know, in the United States... The solution to pain, back pain is, is operate and 
rarely does it does it impact in a positive way. So this gentleman was in great distress. He wanted to check out of the clinic. And I said, you know what? I'm going to write the orders for you to check out. While you're sitting here, would you just breathe with me? Yeah. So it wasn't your kind of breath work. It was just take some deep breaths. Yeah, what we call breathing with purpose. Yes. And yeah. just allow, you know, and I would, I, I guided him very little. And he just sat there and breathed, you know, hold, held it at the inspiration and then did a long exhale. <laughs> at, at, and at the end of about a minute and a half, I said, you know, you could tell that he was, went from this to like this. And I said, well, you know, how's your back? And he said, oh, it's much better. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, that's wonderful. What's what on a 10 point scale? He said, it's a three. So I said, oh, so it went from a 10 to a three in one and a half minutes with breathing. And he said, yes, but it's going to come back. It's going to get worse again. And I said, what wonderful news. You have another breath that you get to take after that. Yes, let's breathe it. So that <laughs> whole story, you know, that it's going to get worse and it's not going to last and you know, we only have this minute, right? Yes. This yes, moment. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, we, we try and teach people. It's it's hard work it because is. we live in the future and we live with these projections, these awfulization. And uh, I wanted to say one other thing about your sensitivity to pain. Yeah. There's a chemical basis for that. There's an enzymatic basis for certain people who are more sensitized to pain. It's called COMT. Yeah. So we actually know that some people tend to catastrophize, to make the pain worse, if you yeah. will. And working with those thoughts really changes the whole process. Yeah. And I, I also thought and have been in my practice seeing people who have stories like mine, mm -hmm. that we become adult in a very early age. In my case, like when my dad died, I was three and we have the loss of the father and the loss of the first family and then the loss of the second family and country and starting to work. I start work at 13. So it's like I manage m a mental stress and emotional stress very good. But if I cut my finger, half of the country will know, first of all. <laughs> and then is so I, I have observed with some of my clients to how is it that there is we keep like when one area mm -hmm. when we become when we didn't have time to be children, yes. how we keep one area as children. Yes. And it's the area, for example, in my case, instead of panicky, what I do, I just surround myself with kind people like, as I said before, Dr. Elena Pedersen is here with us today and kind people who will help me in this moment yes. in with kindness, with breathing and with again with meaning and in in that way i have gone to to a level that i can deal with pain to mm -hmm. uh, to to for example i'm so scared of injection mm -hmm. that i become very tolerable to do teeth treatment without okay. anesthesia I mean, what about which that which is painful though. which is painful yes. so so all these things yes. show you show me how strong we are yes. and what things means for us. Yes, and, and I mean really what, what comes from your story is the power of our mind. Yes. And the, the facts about chronic pain that we, we teach our patients uh, in, in Las Vegas and what I teach when I, when I like at, at, at ICAT, I, I gave a talk. And the whole principle is that thoughts and feelings about the pain, you know, that yes. this and that's going to, and oh my gosh, a needle and that makes the pain worse. Yeah. It enlarges the process. And if you can teach people to decrease their anxiety yeah. and to and with breath and with mindfulness and yes. with cognitive behavioral therapies. And yes. there's a whole variety of ways to impact this. If we teach them the the, the funnel gets narrower and they, yes. they suffer less. And yes. we're really talking about suffering. Exactly. Because the pain is a physical sensation. And the physical sensation lodges in the brain. And the brain is really where all this is happening because the spot where the pain lands in the limbic system is the same spot where anxiety and fear and yes. anger yes. and, incidentally, addiction. So it's not any wonder that if somebody gets a hold of a drug that fixes the, all of that, even though it's temporary, that they're drawn to do that over and over and over mm -hmm. again, even though it's causing problems. Yes. So the thing we, we, we've been teaching about, even when you go into this acute pain, Keep the breathing going and do whatever you have to do. If you have to go to the clinic again, if you have to go to the hospital again. And slowly, slowly we have these reports saying, well, I came back halfway. I manage it. I manage it. So I, I, I guess this is your experience also yes. using wanted, all these alternative yes. techniques that yes. we... 
Yeah, I, I wanted to add one other fact, which is that we found, I mentioned the enzyme, you probably have it, a, a variant of an enzyme that causes the pain to be magnified. Okay. So that it, it's, it's responsible for a sensitivity to pain. That is caused in part by genetics. So if you were my patient, I would talk to you about your mom and your yes. dad and your uncles and your yes. aunts and your children, uh, if you have any, because we tend to see the same pain syndrome in parents and in children. And then the second thing that ex accelerates the pain experience is trauma. Yeah. We've talked at this conference a lot about trauma. So people <coughs> who have had physical, emotional, sexual trauma and a, and a medical version of trauma. People who've been, I see people who have back pain and they go to the uh, surgeon and they take out the disc and then they fuse the spine and then they get an infection and then, you know, they're in the hospital for three months. It's all very traumatized. Yes. And that trauma causes the, the central process of pain to be accelerated. So yes. what I tell my patients is until and unless you deal with the thoughts and feelings about the pain, you're never going to get better. Yes. I have this, uh, I have this now that you're talking about the mother and the grandmother. Mm -hmm. I'm coming from a family that they endure, how you say, they, mm -hmm. they, they so, manage yeah. the pain with the pack of medication. Uh -huh. Yes. But it's like, while me, the pain, as the pain stopped me, so what I have done is to be so preventive and healthy because I don't want to go to that place and then take the medication. So I'm somebody who gets safe from medication even though I have inherited some of their illnesses. Yeah. But doing all the things that you propose in your workshop and it's like I have done all that even though I still have, I still have their illnesses, I manage it in a different way. Yes, and you suffer less. And I suffer less yes. because of the prevention. Now, if we, if me and my mother, we are exposed to the same impact, let's say we both were cut, maybe I will scream more, maybe mm -hmm. I will make more scandal, and maybe she will hold it more, but, but I would look for the holistic remedy so quick that maybe I will heal earlier. Yes. And, and because life is joy, and for, for me life is not with pain, so I will be back into my life and forget about it, while well, maybe they will be going on with medication, and one medication will bring another dramatic yes. situation, etc. And typically, people in your mom's generation aren't educated in the processes. You know, yeah. explain observer to a, 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 an elderly person is very difficult. I mean, yes. we have a lot of elderly people, because of course, as you get older, your body deteriorates, unfortunately, so pain conditions increase. So we see people with arthritis and, uh, you know, with spinal disease and degeneration. And it's, it's a tough sell. Uh, you know, people get angry at me because I say, you have to work on your thoughts and feelings, and they're like, no, <laughs> take me to physical therapy and uh, breathing, meditation, I'm not interested. And, you know, little by little, the, the, the environment, the milieu helps people try different things. Yes. And it, it, when you try these things, they work, as yeah, you know. They work. You know, you spend a little time, and then you practice, and you get better and better yes. at executing the, the technique, and your life gets better. Yes, and yes. For, yes. For me nowadays, whatever happened to me, first of all, I breathe. Crazy. If I don't have a place where I can lie down and, and breathe, I just breathe wherever I am. Yes. And also, we have these think that I call cocktail breathing that nobody will notice, but I'm breathing with purpose yes. to be able to manage the situation. Because situation not only in the physical pain, it's the emotional pain is nowadays we have different type of rejection, different type of bullying, different time of we travel so much and we lose uh, the flight and we have so many commitment. I mean, we are exposed to so much pain and yes. stress and, and be exposed to that. So it's very important to keep connecting with the breathing. Yes. So what, what have made you so special? Mm -hmm. What would you say is the thing that you have created or the combination of tools that you have created together? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. I, I'd say uh, we have a team of people that are dedicated, uh, extremely dedicated to people with addiction. and. The, the pain program grew out of, of, of that environment. And it, it really, I think that the most important thing that we do at our clinic is pay very close attention to what people are saying. 
uh, it was uh, another speaker who talked about exquisite listening. Yes, I like this. With heart and compassion. You know, uh, in the medical system, I can't tell you how many patients will come in. I'll take a history, and m my history taking is mostly just saying, "Tell me about your story." Yes. And the people will talk, and they'll, you know, that they love to talk about it in <laughs> essence, but they've never had a chance to fully uh, tell their story. And at the end of maybe 30 or 40 minutes, uh, we'll be done. And they'll say, oh, thank you. I feel so much better. <laughs> and I'll think to my, because some of my response is, oh, my God, this person, this poor person is suffering. You know, because we suffer along with people even yes. as a clinician. Yes. But the, the willingness to sit through it and to yeah. provide that, that ear is the beginning of the, of the recovery process. We're very committed to take people off these habit-forming drugs. It's nasty, you know, coming off the drugs is really tough, but we're very committed to doing that. And then we go on and we teach people much of what you teach in, yes. in your practice, which is really how do I function more effectively in the world, yes. and what can I use, and we use uh, acupuncture and massage and Reiki and uh, physical therapy and yoga and, and work with the breath. Oh, wonderful. So what will be your advice of anybody who's going into recovery now? Recovery from addiction or recovery yes, from... Yes, recovery from addiction. Oh, I think uh, be good to yourself, be gentle, be patient, because it goes more slowly than we would like. Yes. And I'll tell you, the most important thing in my recovery that I learned and that I can teach any other patient or somebody in, in, a, in a recovery process is to not take yourself too seriously. <laughs> And, and the same with people with pain. Yeah, pain seems something. like it's life and death, but yeah. you and I know it's not. Yeah. I mean, I have terrible arthritis in my thumb. It's throbbing now. You know, it's a strong yeah. feeling. Yeah. You know? My husband is uh, is athlete, and he always uh, uh, he always tell me, "Do you think us we don't have fear? Of course we have it. We fear it. We feel it, but we do it anyway." Um, and I want to tell you also, I came here. I live in Cyprus now. And I came with one of my students who has anxiety flying. Mm. So we did, uh, we did a session. I said session on air, but it's session mm -hmm. on the flight. And it was very interesting for her to measure that when did, and, and we had many turbulences, like different length. It's like if I would have asked exactly for it, yeah? <laughs> so what I was doing with her is every time the turbulence come, I will tell her, yes, it is a turbulence. I feel it too. Yes. And, the, and the hostess feel it too. It's just we keep functioning yes. and, and you, you have the anxiety. Now, let's breathe. And I make her count the breathing, yeah? Mm -hmm. how, you know, how many seconds? And then we measure when she gets anxious. And oh, the whole flight, you know, we have like four or five times different turbulences. And in some moments she noticed this. She said, huh? I feel so stressed, but my breathing still the same when the, when the turbulence yeah. was not here. So she could experience by herself yeah. how much the fear was in her mind, but her body didn't have, didn't has it, mm -hmm. didn't have it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was a key moment in her process of healing. Yes. That how much, because she was doubting about herself, do I create it? Yes. And I was saying, no, I feel it. Yes. I also feel it. But what is, was import, important for her is to see how much was in the mind, how much it was in the body, and in which of the turbulences was in the mind and in the body. Yes. So it reduces our work from every turbulence to some type of turbulence. Mm -hmm. And it was so good from yes. Cyprus to London that now we're right. going to do another one from, from L.A. or from Zurich to L.A. LA, Zurich LA, which is going to be very long, yeah, yeah. and we're going to keep doing that until yes. she managed a, a methodology herself to be self-healing. Yes. And of course, there's turbulence all over our lives. Tell me about right? it. <laughs> it's not just in the air. And yeah. really, it's the, the learning the skills to just sort of roll with it. You know? yes. And again, not taking it so seriously, I think is valuable to be able to laugh at you know, I'm in a plane, it's safe, I'm going to be fine. You yeah. know, to really sort of on some level know it and on some level not be able to see that that's true. And talking about plane, this is a place mm -hmm. where we can have collective panic because there is a lot of people in that enclosed place who feel very similar. So it, it gets quite contagious. Yes. And many times in families who one member feel the chronic, tell me about 
family inheritance about pain. Yes, and not only inheritance, but I, I, I thought when you first mentioned it, the, the story I thought of was I was sitting with a husband and wife, and the wife had had five surgeries on her cervical spine and was on a lot of opioids and was coming in for detox, and he was interviewing me, you know, to see if we were going to be good enough for his wife. And I said, so how many surgeries have you had, Marjorie? And he answered, we had five surgeries, doctor. <laughs> and I said, wait, wait a minute, who had surgery? It was we. So yes. the, and, and with parents and with children, it's the same thing. It is, you know, we have what are called mirror neurons so that you wince and I experience. I yes. feel the pain in the same part of my brain as yours. So in a, in a family, not only are there genetics, but there is a connection. And, and we see people suffer along with their, uh, with their partner or their child or their parent. And, and you know the term codependence, which is you're more important than me. Well, this is what we call malignant codependence. In a family system, the, the draw of the pain the, the fact that, I'm, that, that you're in pain makes me so miserable. I want so much to help you. I cannot, uh, p families need to set boundaries with patients. They cannot do that with patients in pain because after all, the doctor prescribed the medicine. So it's very challenging, uh, but the, the, the family system is very important to the recovery process. From very pain. important. So do you see them all? Do you see the family? We bring the family. Yes. So it, a lot of our patients come from out of state or, uh, or across the country, sometimes international. We have a four-day family program where it's very intensive, and it's only the family member. We don't bring the patient because the patient distracts the family. So the, the process in the family program is really, this is your opportunity to figure out how you can live with the uncertainty and the frustration and the fear and the anxiety of addiction addiction and pain and how you can feel okay even though your partner is suffering or your parent is suffering or your child is suffering. It's a very effective program and then at the end we bring the patient in so that the whole family comes together and works on that. And, and what is the average treatment I know is as generalized? Yeah, it's, uh, for detox it's about a week to ten days and then another four weeks after that, typical. Uh, some people stay a little longer. And do, do you have uh, follow-up? After. We do. Uh, if they live in Las Vegas, we have outpatient program and, and uh, starts with three times a week and then once a week. Uh, we do telephonic phone up. Uh, we have a, a company that we work with called Take Courage Coaching and they actually will do telephone. They have case managers who call the patient and then they have a group once a week. And they're, they're structured to look at goals because what we haven't talked about but there's a lot of physical rehabilitation as part of pain recovery movement motion exercise the physical therapy and all of that has to be maintained after people leave and do you have a representative in other cities or country who can do your follow-up no we don't we partner yeah we'd love to but we partner with people like you <laughs> <laughs> next time we have somebody from cyprus believe me they'll come back and see you <laughs> And one more question. Well, some more questions. Uh -huh. uh, do you include chiropractice in the process? Of course. Okay. We, have a, we have a chiropractor on staff, uh, Dr. Christine Bakir. Uh, she comes three times a week. And it's interesting. Some patients are very fearful of chiropractic because they've had uh, surgeries. And in, in the States, the surgeons say, no, don't see a chiropractor. So. She's, she's very good. She'll do acupuncture, auricular acupuncture, just at the beginning. And then she'll offer to adjust, and she'll do whatever the patient is willing to participate with. And some people do very well. You know, the, the treatment modalities have shown us that some people do really well with certain treatments, and other people do really well with certain treatments. And I can't tell you who does well. So we try and give people yes, a big yes. uh, variety of experiences. Yeah. And then they get to choose to continue in, in experiences. Yeah. Some think, people swear by chiropractor. It's the best treatment they have. Yeah, as, I think as our age, oh, I mean age as practitioners, mm -hmm. we know that there is not one thing that is good for everybody. Right. I want to ask you another question. What is the youngest patient you have had 17. in chronic pain? 17. Okay. It happens sooner. You know, children in pain are very sad and uh, very challenging. We're not equipped to treat children, but we have had a 17-year-old. And uh, what's interesting is to see the 17-year-old in group with the 65-year-old and how they work together and learn from each other and bond with each other. It, it's quite spectacular. 
So what is your, um, how, 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 what is you, how do you feel the ECAD um, uh, put together this conference and unite us to come from different parts of the world? Yeah. And I'm so pleased to be yeah. here with Likewise. you in this moment. Uh, yes. It's spectacular. Yes. It's just yeah. everywhere I walk, there's yes. people with different accents, with different experiences, with different training, with different uh, uh, orientation. And, you know, we, we get together and we talk and we have a lot of similarities. Yeah. Uh, I, it's been wonderful. The, the sessions are wonderful and uh, both the ones done by, by the imported Americans and, uh, you know, I, I heard one on opera and mental illness and I, it's, oh, it's, it's been terrific, really terrific. And as a visionary man and man in, in mission, what's next? <laughs> what's for, next, Mel? For me? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I just have to keep going. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I talk about working less, but I work more. So yeah. uh, I guess well, there's a recovery program for work a whole <laughs> right? uh, I, I love to teach. You know, I would, I would go all over the world if I had the opportunity. Uh, because the, the message that I convey about chronic pain is unknown for a lot of people. Yes, it is. Uh, and I think especially those in the addiction field, like there are at ICAD, if they treat people with pain and addiction as if they didn't have pain and it's just the addiction, they miss the boat. Mm -hmm. And the patient gets uh, poor care. So I'm very committed to, to, yeah. to spreading To this holistic yes. view yes. of yes. the treatment, yes. Well, thank you very much for being here with us first thank of you. all in London, in ICAD. And thank you very much for this interview. And there is any word you want to say to our viewer? No, just thank you very much. This is great. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, ma'am. See you soon.